Ай, Владимир. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi, hi. Anna. Hi, hi. Nice to see you. Vladimir is uh, in Kladno, right? In Czech Republic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, close to Kladno in the village, close to Prague. Aha, uh -huh. very nice. You're very welcome. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Luca is, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh... We hi. Hi, hi Luca. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, where are you right now, Luca? Uh, physically, I'm in Italy now. Ah, Italy. Ah. I was yeah, thinking yeah. about that, that. You may be in Italy, but uh, you can be in any other place as well. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely. Well, I, I, I've been uh, no, I've been in in Oslo and. Until a couple of weeks ago, then I'm spending few few days back in Italy, and we'll go back to Oslo. And, uh, you know, I, I I I had to limit my travels, you know, as everybody else, and I'm really missing it, honestly. <laughs> okay. Hi, Bets. Uh, hi, Jim. Hi, hi Jim. Hi, Bets. Uh -huh. Hello. Hi, Jim. Hello, Anna. Hi. And Hi. Chris is there, but she is muted because she's in a pub public space. So she will just communicate on uh, uh, chat. Good. Okay, let's uh, maybe wait one more minute and then we can start. But in the meantime, while we're waiting, maybe we can introduce each other to people who we don't know. And so let's everyone say a little bit uh, about themselves and I'll just uh, start with the first person on my left or right I don't know from which point of view and that's Eugene and then you pick somebody else and so on okay ah, okay. okay well hello my name is Eugene Matosov <clears throat> gosh uh, uh, I'm uh, right now not far from Anna located maybe 10 12 blocks away in Philadelphia I'm um from University of Delaware, from School of Education, and my interests are in democratic dialogic education, or democratic, yeah, I like it, democratic dialogic education, yeah, that's good, and many other things. Uh, so uh, I'm very much interested to learn about this uh, uh, democratic schools in, uh, in Israel. Thank you, and <clears throat> next uh, person will be, next to me will be Vladimir. So hello everybody, my name is Vladimir Dobesh. I'm uh, from the Czech Republic and I'm a co-founder of the Czech uh, Democratic School Donu Felix, which operates, uh, okay, we, we closed the seventh year now. We have also high school, the basic school, high school. Mm. It's getting up. Mm. And we are considered kind of flagship of Free Democrat. Very nice to meet Anna uh, when I was visiting Israel and our friends in Jerusalem. Uh, Sudbury School. So I very. <laughs> okay. Very much look forward to hear also on her experience. I see only Anna. So <laughs> Anna now. Oh. The pen is yours. Okay. So uh, my turn now. Okay. Um, I'm Anna Marianovic Shane, and uh, yeah, I'm also interested in the democratic dialogic. Uh, education and schooling and uh, I will be holding this talk uh, after my visit of two months to Israel and learning about democratic schools there and so um, I'll tell much more in my talk so uh, next uh, to me is Betts. Hi I'm Betts. Um, I uh, studied in the Sudbury uh, Democratic School in Jerusalem um, from first grade until I graduated in uh, in 2015. Okay, and uh, choose whoever else do you want to say something about themselves. Um, Luca. Okay, so um, my name is uh, Luca Tateo. Uh, I'm currently a professor of um, uh, epistemology, theory, and methodology of qualitative research 
at the Department of Special Needs Education at the University of Oslo in Norway. But um, my background, general background, is cultural psychology, in particular, cultural psychology of education. And I'm uh, now uh, becoming more and more interested in the issues of um, uh, uh, ecology and uh, epistemic injustice related to education. So next one, next one, I will invite uh, Jim. Hi all, my name is Jim Reet Mulder. I'm a founder and ongoing staff member at Self-Directed Democratic School, The Circle School in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We are uh, soon going to begin our 39th year, founded in 1984. Um, I'm also author of the book, When Kids Rule the School. My interest is in democratic schools around the world. And Christy. Okay, Christy, if you, uh, she uh, just wrote us all because she cannot uh, use her voice and picture. Okay, thank you, Christy. Uh, so I guess uh, we can. And uh, I think that uh, I will just uh, give you a brief uh, or deeper presentation. Oh, no, Anna, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt you, but I want to make an announcement before ah, that. Okay, please do that. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make an announcement about this. Uh, the whole event that we have right now is a part of Open Symposium. It's a new format that we launched uh, two weeks ago. So the idea is that it will be every two weeks, there will be some event, let me put that way, it could be presentation, discussions, whatever. So let me just share the screen very quickly. And, uh, I sh and also let me send a link to you to that as well. Let me send link first and share the screen. This is a Google spreadsheet where you can schedule your event. And let me show how to do that. Uh, it's very simple, I hope. Um, let me share the screen. So um, this is a spreadsheet. You can have access to that. Uh, if you can see, it's very simple. It's a list of events. The first event that I crossed out is one that was already happened in the bold current event. Uh, you, you can see that this is the date of the event. Uh, it's today. Uh, who's sponsoring that? <clears throat> what it's our topic and maybe a little bit description if you want to do that that's fine uh what kind of format you want to do uh and uh, the link to the usual it could be zoom or it could be i don't know uh microsoft teams or whatever you want <clears throat> if you want to put some commentaries feel free to do that if you want to create a new uh something a new column feel free to do that so i just want to say that in two weeks uh, another event scheduled by me, I'm sponsoring that, Community versus uh, Society, is kind of a uh, normative vision of uh, sociality in joint self-education. It sounds like very uh, jargonistic, but uh, I couldn't figure out like how to do it less jargonistic so far. Next one actually sponsored by Christy. Thanks a lot, Christy, for sponsoring that. It's kind of discussion of self-directed higher education. And she's doing that... Uh, uh, via workshop, and there is a link again, a Zoom link, which is will use my Zoom. So welcome, it's August 2nd. Then Dina Zaretska, uh, she's originally from Russia, but right, right now she's in Uganda. She's organizing another event, which is, will be a presentation plus discussion, and also she wants to use my Zoom for that, which is fine. And it's about advantages and challenges of uh, horizontal uh, learning. Uh, so, and it will be presentation plus discussion. All other dates are like free, feel free to put whatever you want. So there is no, although we call it democratic uh, dialogic uh, education uh, kind of under auspices of that, but it will be defined by the people who ever wants to do any presentation or any event. Let me call it event. I don't like to call it presentations. So uh, don't be shy, just put there, or please tell your colleagues if uh, they want to do that. Uh, and again, it's open for everyone, and please spread the news about that. Any questions about this? So I send the link to you. Uh, 
and I can see that, oops. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Luca needs to leave in a short. So. Okay, so let me stop sharing. And in this case, Anna, we are yours. Okay. All right, so I will, uh, yeah, just wanted to say uh, that uh, I will uh, just uh, relay my experiences and what I learned <clears throat> in a uh, yeah, uh, uh, informal way, improvisational way, but you're welcome to stop and uh, yeah, add something. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, ask questions, or if I did, did something that you think you can add more information, like maybe Betts, maybe Vladimir, who I met in Jerusalem, and Betts as a former student, please uh, jump in at, at any time. Okay, so let me just, uh, for those who never heard uh, what I'm doing, I am a, um, uh, uh, a colleague of Eugene Matusov uh, for uh, a long, long time, but we have been working on uh, studying democratic and dialogic pedagogy uh, a long time. And in the last several years, I've been engaged in a, uh, 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 trying to create a special issue of our journal Dialogic uh, Pedagogy that we also founded uh, a few years ago, 10 years ago. And the special issue is specifically about democratic and dialogic pedagogy and how they cross their synergies, their contradictions. And uh, yeah, within that one, I have studied schools, uh, democratic schools in Norway in the 60s. Uh, one of them lasted until the beginning of the 2000s. A uh, very deep uh, study of that. Also, Jim and I uh, have uh, had uh, two interviews that will be published there. And in, the, in this whole background, I uh, received the Fulbright uh, uh, Award and the, one of the countries where I visited, and that's the first one was Israel. And so I spent uh, uh, April and May in Israel trying to find out uh, uh, just to scratch the surface. And even the, though I think it's just the surface, I think there was a lot of very important, interesting things to, uh, uh, to talk about. So uh, uh, I won't give any more about this background. If anybody is interested, we can talk about it uh, later. So uh, what about the Israeli uh, democratic schools? First of all, one of the curiosities for me was that there, there is more than 25 democratic schools in Israel, a country of about uh, nine and a half million of people, while there is about 100, uh, and 20 schools in the United States that has 350, uh, uh, thousand, three million, 350,000 million people. So if, we, if the, the proportions are like almost 336 times more schools in Israel per person than in the United States. And still democratic schools in the, uh, the whole world as such are not very known among edu educators. Uh, very small amount of people knows about them, but in Israel, everybody knows about them. It's probably because uh, this whole uh, huge amount and visibility of these schools. So uh, what I learned is that the, uh, uh, these schools have some kind of a status uh, uh, called special schools in Israel, which are among many different types of special schools among which there is special education schools, but not only. Israel has many, many schools because of huge amount of a, uh, diversity divisions that are also co conflictual divisions. So there are schools for Israeli children, Jewish children, and Israeli Arab children that are usually separate. There are schools in Israel for a very religious uh, community and for secular, uh, schools, there are schools for uh, uh, um, poor people, immigrants that come from neighboring countries or workers uh, and school uh, that need to learn Hebrew or something like that. So there are many different types of schools and there are schools that also try to kind of bridge these big uh, political, ethnic, uh, religious uh, breaks in the society too. Uh, democratic schools uh, uh, politically, economically fall into that special schools, which means from the point of view of the uh, uh, policies that they are financed uh, by the government, but not quite fully. 
the government finances public schools fully, uh, but uh, some of the special schools uh, have more or less and uh, democratic schools uh, get about probably less than a half than the tuition for the students in the public schools. So parents and families still have to subsidize very heavily people in democratic schools. So this is kind of like the general background, which in itself is very interesting in itself. Uh, I, I'm just looking at some of my notes. So I visited only two schools out of these 25 and more schools in Israel. I visited Jerusalem Sudbury School in uh, Jerusalem, and I visited the first democratic school that was ever opened in Israel, which is a school in Hadera, uh, opened by Jacob Hecht or Yaakov Hecht. Uh, in the, the 70s, in 1972, and the Jerusalem school was opened in 2002, right, uh, Beth, about that time? Yeah, yeah, correct. And the two experiences that I had were very, very, very different. And so I'll first describe one school and then the other school, a uh, uh, quick facts, and I'll start with the Jerusalem Sudbury School. So as the title says, uh, yeah, the school was founded on the model of the Sudbury schools. And as far as I understood, the, the founders, uh, which were uh, uh, Yudis and Ricky Benor, and uh, yeah, a colleague of them, uh, they knew um, um, Daniel Greenberg's sister and uh, through her also Daniel, Greenberg, and they were all involved in creating school that is based on the principles of the Sudbury Valley School. So I know many people here know about it, but uh, yeah, just uh, to, for those who don't completely, or just to remind ourselves, uh, the main values that drive such a school is, I would say, human dignity. Uh, which entails uh, freedom of everyone to uh, um, choose uh, whatever course of uh, life they want. I would say that the principle is more not learning than uh, le living a full life uh, as possible uh, in school. Um, what it entails is that uh, yeah, people trust each other, respect each other, and, and expect responsibility of each person to take uh, uh, in their own hands, their own affairs, and to also trust and respect other people as much as possible. So everyone in school has equal rights uh, of uh, decision-making about themselves and the others, which means that the students and the staff are uh, having the same uh, uh, the same say in voting for whatever decisions have to be made and decisions are about everything about running this school from uh, material things to uh, 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 various issues that the people come up with, whether to take some travel somewhere or to organize some other activities or to buy something, whatever the, uh, the life of the community or the society is, which is very interesting uh, um, about the, uh, what decisions have, what, what kind of impact on whom. Um, so uh, in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem uh, Sudbury School, they recently moved. I don't know, Bats, if you were in their new location. Uh, and I don't know how the old location looks. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. there are two buildings that, uh, in between which there is a kind of large court and uh, there are some lounging chairs, tables and chairs uh, and, and a big area where people can just move around. And this is where we were sitting uh, yeah, and having a big, big talk with the, uh, with the uh, um, uh, whoever of the students was interested and also staff interesting to talk to me. And one of the things that for me was kind of like a, uh, I would put it as a title if, uh, and when I write about it is uh, what uh, a graduating student Asaf said at one moment, he was one of the participants 
uh, his, uh, when I asked him how did he come, when did he come to school, he said he came in the fifth grade following his very good friend Gil. And uh, when he came to school, he, he said, I sort of fell asleep and for about half a year, after which I woke up and started to live. <laughs> So he started to live which, uh, from the fifth grade to the 12th because he was just uh, graduating this year. Uh, he became uh, like the soul of this uh, uh, current community of uh, uh, students and staff. He's in every possible committee, every possible organization, uh, uh, serves as every, uh, every uh, almost like running uh, single-handedly many, many, many different things that are happening in, in school. Um, so uh, I, other students to who I talked uh, had very different stories. Uh, for, one, for instance, uh, they, I had at one point a question about diversity because one of the things that I, uh, I have heard uh, is that uh, uh, democratic schools tend to attract certain kind of a, a type of families that are more European or Western origin, Ashkenazi Jews, middle class, who have certain types of values, and so that there is not much diversity in terms of a, a religiosity or in terms of a, a, a other types of values or ethnicities which proved at that moment not to be true. There were several girls, especially one that uh, talked with me who is very religious and they have a whole movement in the school to put a, make a place for themselves uh, and their own beliefs there. Um, uh, but the, that critique also I read in some other places, uh, in other books too, that it's still a, a kind of like one of the type of these special schools, democratic schools are not trying to bridge uh, in their ideology, but in fact, maybe it's even is expecting that kind of like home and the uh, and school life have the similar type of uh, ideas about life and values, that it makes it much easier. In fact, uh, um, that's a very interesting uh, thing to, to uh, discuss more about. And if anybody wants to jump in, please feel free to do that. Um, so, um, uh, other things that are taking place there uh, when I was there, they were reviving their drama uh, corporation. And for those people who didn't hear about uh, the organizational part, which uh, means that the, uh, uh, the main deci decision body in the school is the uh, uh, parliament or the general assembly. And then for different types of activities uh, that happen in, in school, uh, there are different either committees uh, that take place of, let's say, building or uh, trips or something like that, visits of other people, and there are different corporations, which is uh, uh, organized the uh, uh, pra practices about certain themes or, uh, of life, like drama corporation, music com corporation, science corporations. So these uh, corporations run programs that would be um, academic or intellectual or whatever you want to call them, the programs of interest that are around certain theme of the sphere of uh, interest of people. So Drama Corporation was being revived. Do, do you want to say something, Beth? No, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope I'm representing it the way how you experienced it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, I was there and they had to translate for me because everything, of course, it was in Hebrew. Uh, and uh, they, they s were moderated by one more older student who knew about previous corporation drama that uh, somehow fell out of uh, work for a few years. And now the whole new batch of uh, about 11 to 12 year olds wanted to put a play on. And because of that, they were reviving this drama corporation and had a lot of interesting discussions, whether they will have one head or two heads of corporation or three, because there were three girls, two girls that were together putting this 
play on and a third girl that was very interested in running this whole business and so there was a uh, a lot of discussion about how to organize themselves and who is going to do what whether it's going to be only around this one play or it will continue and also include some other things uh, and it was already the toward the end of the school year so that was not clear and of course I couldn't understand everything that was going on and uh, in my talks with the uh, in the center there with the, all this uh, the uh, children and students and staff at one point it turned out that the uh, uh, there was a decision of the uh, General Assembly to forbid English speaking uh, at one point because there were too many uh, people who were speaking English and they it, it uh, seemed to other people who were not English speakers that they are being excluded. So for a little while, uh, I don't know how long it lasted, uh, English was prohibited as a language of speaking in everyday places if there are many people who don't understand it. But that was overturned, that rule was overturned and now it's a, yeah, again like a freedom of speech, you can speak in every language. So this is a, uh, in general, uh, 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 and from my very short visit of about three hours and speaking to in individual students, uh, uh, what, uh, what I saw. What for me was very interesting is that uh, I learned a lot about democratic schools in visiting Jim's school in uh, the circle school and talking with Jim and, and discussing these issues. So uh, we had a very similar vocabulary, like it was the same culture of democratic education, the Sudbury model. So we didn't have problems understanding and describing to each other what's a corporation, what's a committee, what's a judiciary committee that uh, every day solves the various issues uh, of uh, behavior, conflicts, rules uh, being overturned and, and things like that. And uh, in that sense, uh, uh, Jerusalem Sudbury School uh, does belong to the family of uh, Sudbury Valley model schools, I, I think. Uh, and that's uh, from that one visit that I can say, I don't know much more deeper in there. Um, on the other hand, the Hadera School, which was the first school uh, organized by ya Jakob Hecht, is, has a very different feel and model. Although the main values that drive it are the same, and the students also can choose what to do during the day or what not to do. Uh, they don't have to go to classes or, or, or be forced to do anything they don't want to. It's just a different school. First of all, the number of students in the in Jerusalem Sudbury School is about 100. And there are over 700 students in Hadera, which uh, they have four buildings that are clustered uh, next to each other. And uh, they have a lot of pavilions around where there are classroom or different kind of studios for drama, for art studio, for uh, smaller classrooms or not. So there is a lot of more uh, uh, kind of uh, academic activity go going on. And I think the Hadera School is based on academic activities much more than Jerusalem Sudbury schools. Uh, uh, first, they could always offer so many different uh, classes that are very conventional classes because there will always be somebody who wants to go to their those classes, which is not true when you have a small number of students that it would be the case. So they do have teachers that are special, like Arabic speaking, uh, Arabic language uh, classes are always going on. Art classes are always going on. It's not just a corporate, there is no corporation. There are teachers who teach these subjects. And the teachers also have their own kind of like a committee, teacher committee, if you want to call it like that, where they meet once uh, or twice a week with the, uh, their own teaching issues, problems. They have a uh, specialist uh, in um, teaching uh, or educational psychology or uh, he's a psychologist who helps them with whatever problems they bring into their meetings. I was in a part of their meeting uh, that they were interested in more in what I'm doing than what they are 
uh, doing so they uh, we, when what they told me the um, is more again about uh, an attitude to uh, uh, who a teacher can be in a in a school like that that you cannot force children uh, to do anything they have a right to uh, and the teacher seemed kind of like they were seemed okay with that but maybe not hundred uh, percent uh, okay with that. I, I don't know uh, it, it there there was some nostalgia uh, among some other people uh, some of the teachers about like if their classes are not chosen very much. Uh, so I would say that in that sense, uh, they, there was a different feel in the Hadera uh, Democratic School, in spite of the same uh, um, uh, main principles of uh, and values of human dignity, freedom, trust, responsibility, respect of each other. Uh, another thing that in Hadera they have that uh, 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 is not taught like that in uh, Jerusalem, Sudbury, or in the circle school, they have learning centers, uh, which is uh, a form of a um, not class, uh, cl organization of classes, but organization of a uh, uh, like a library could be a learning center or a, uh, la a laboratory, the, the, the different uh, academic subjects that exist uh, can have a, their own center where people can come in and walk in and walk out and get any help from the person who is a, a staff or a teacher running these centers. And the third thing that they have, and I'm not sure whether you have that in the uh, Jerusalem uh, Sudbury School, uh, that is the mentoring system. That's a very, very strong component of the Hadera school uh, that uh, each student uh, chooses uh, a mentor among the staff that follows them throughout their whole stay in that school uh, and it's almost like university advisors uh, they are uh, kind of like advising each student about their academic and about uh, other things but mostly I think about academic there is a book written very recently unfortunately it's, it's still only in Hebrew uh, <laughs> I can show you, but it doesn't mean that you can all read. Uh, that may be. It's a, uh, called the Meeting at the Heart Level, uh, Dialogic Tutoring at the Democratic School in Hadera uh, by Dror Zimri. And uh, I couldn't get yet the, the uh, PDF format. Maybe it would be easier to translate, but I don't speak Hebrew. And, and I would love to read that book about dialogic tutoring. Um, I was there about also three hours and because it's so big, uh, I was not able to talk about uh, my questions with any particular students, but uh, there are so many places to visit. For instance, there is a big, uh, huge playground that was uh, constructed by a very renowned two artists of Israel in consultation with uh, students. And an anecdote was that uh, some of the uh, things that uh, swings or whatever, the, 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 the contraptions on which children could climb or do things, uh, had to be taken down because of the inspections the, uh, the, from from uh, Israeli educational authorities thought that they may have had been hazardous or not, but that after they were taken out, there is more injuries now than before. <laughs> so that's a local anecdote for them. Um, so th this is this is in general what my uh, uh, Two visits had two very different flavors. The, in Hadera, they also have a new principle. That's another thing that in Israel, uh, you toward the outer uh, community of the uh, politics and, uh, and uh, Ministry of Education, you have to have a principle in such a school. And uh, internally, that's also just a staff member with one vote uh, as everybody else. So they have a new person who, who does not have experience in democratic school, but is very willing to learn. And he was taking a lot of notes from our talk, uh, uh, learning 
more for me than uh, being able to tell me very deeply what's going on because he was just there in less than a year. So um, another curiosity about Hadera School is that they have a smoking uh, area which is outside and which is used both by staff and the students and that on and off there were uh, attempts to uh, close it or to fight against smoking but uh, the principle of everybody's freedom they just need to keep it clean and uh, tidy but they can go there and smoke they have ashtrays and uh, and they have benches and it's uh, their smoking area so what else i can tell you well, that's a, that's a uh, uh, mostly in a very nutshell. So, um, if uh, I'd like Beth to tell us, if if you want to, something about uh, what would be interesting that I didn't mention, and then also Vladimir, how you uh, encountered and what inspired you to open your school. Um, okay, I don't know if, ah, here's Vladimir. Sorry, my internet cut out there. Ah, okay, it's not good enough. Well, when you have it better, if you want to jump in, Beth, please feel free. Uh, Was that you wanted me to say something uh, interesting? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you if if you think that I missed saying something important about the school or something from your experience that you would like to share, uh, please uh, feel free to do to say. I think that you have a very good representation. Uh, I mean, I'm sure everyone's experience going to such a school is going to to vary. Um, you know, drastically, but um, yeah, I think uh, I think you did it justice. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, Beth, uh, yeah, uh, what are you doing now in in your life? Uh, I work as a pro. I think he wanted to say programming, but you're cutting out. Okay. Ah, here you are. Sorry, my internet connection seems to keep cutting out. Um, I work as a programmer a small uh, robotics company. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, Anna, so Anna, I have a question for you. Uh, uh -huh. uh, you mentioned about this mentoring, and mm -hmm. you said that every student must choose a mentor is it must choose like what if a student doesn't want to choose any mentor i don't know about that it was mentioned to me at that time when i was visiting and at that time i did not know uh, how important it is i learned about it later and i couldn't ask uh, at the moment when i was in the visit right there but uh, as I understand from reading and from Leora, that's uh, the principal of some uh, emails later, uh, everyone has a student. I'm not sure, I didn't ask the question. Well, uh, for me, it's the almost answer. If everyone has it, it means it's yeah. forced. Mm -hmm. And the question from, because it's just, um, in nature of things, it's never possible that everyone will have, just because, it, I would say the school, it's never, it's not happening uh, on this absolutely total, uh, in, in total way that everyone, whoever interested in something needs to have a mentor. It's not, it's not true. Sometimes people do, sometimes don't. Uh, but so my, my deeper question actually for you, if you know, or maybe for bats, like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but democratic schools financed by the government, uh, uh, by, by the taxes, taxpayers. And my question is, how much it's in a way polluted by that? How much it's uh, a kind of almost like agreement with devil? So because uh, the government then start dictating uh, what has to be done, and how much, uh, in a way, the Israeli democratic schools is a compromise. And where is that compromise? And how deep that compromise is going on in terms of 
that people start believing in these impositions that's coming from the government. Rather than think, oh gosh, we have to do that, but we will do it without much enthusiasm and belief in that, versus they will start doing that and they say, oh, they, because this is actually good for education or for the students. So can you, like, and again, uh, Bats, feel free to also to jump on that if you uh, have any knowledge of that and how you feel about that as well. That will be very interesting. Shall I answer that? Please do. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, as Anna said at the beginning, um, there's sort of different statuses for, for schools in Israel. Um, and at least the Jerusalem uh, Sadbury School is, is what's called partially recognized. So they get partial funding. Um, but it also means that they sort of only partially need to, to follow the, the guidelines of the, of the uh, Ministry of Education. Um, I remember when, when I joined the school in 2003, so it wasn't it wasn't recognized at all um, and we had long uh, debates in the in the assembly uh, to to decide if we wanted to get recognition or if we didn't want to get recognition exactly because like you say it's you know making a deal with the devil um, and ultimately we we opted to get partial recognition uh, and and we sort of found ways to to keep everything you know real and and uh, authentic to the philosophy of the school without making without making any um, important compromises, uh, which was never really on the table. It's the 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 Sudbury system, I think, in general is very radical. Um, it's uh, you know freedom and um, so so it wasn't really an option to to give up on anything. Uh, but but I think there are schools that maybe do that you know, don't necessarily try to find ways to to uh, meet the requirements of the of the ministry while still you know keeping things. Uh, with their philosophy, they're kind of more maybe willing to make compromises, but I don't really know. I only know about our school. Yeah. Uh, when I talked to a Yudis, uh, uh, Benor, and Ricky, uh, that who are the founders, uh, she kind of laughed and says, kind of like, don't ask. Like, it's a, like uh, they say we should do something and we say we will, but nobody looks whether we did or we didn't and we do whatever we want. It's kind of like a gray area um, there, uh, which is similar true to Hadera. Uh, although I think they follow the recommendations of the Israeli Ministry of Education much more just because it fits into their way of working. Yeah. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> sure. yeah. So it's a, it's a very interesting kind of like a status that uh, it's, it's undefined status. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions for, uh, from anybody else? I would like to ask, uh, if nobody has, I would like to ask Vladimir to uh, tell us more about how he learned about the democratic school in uh, Jerusalem and, uh, and how you went about and opened your own school in, uh, uh, in Czech Republic. Yeah, so thank you, Anna. So the idea came from my wife. He also cutting a little bit. Uh, she's a psychologist and she's dealing with, can, can you hear me? Yes, um, sometimes you're cutting a little bit. We hear you and then you uh, freeze. Can you hear me? Okay. okay, I hope it will be okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, my wife uh, was teaching um, parents and uh, teachers how to do respectful communication, nonviolent communication. 
and this kind of things and uh, the idea of a school where this would be would become true the full respect to to kids and to each other uh, came from there and when i was in one business trip in jerusalem i known about um, uh, the jerusalem Sudbury that it's there from some movie and i just tried to to call and ask for a meeting and i was lucky that i met Judith and uh, some students in 2015, it was like March 2015, just uh, the year when we established, when we opened the scope uh, school, our school in September. And uh, it was really big uh, kind of emotional touch to, to see how it works in reality, because of before we known it only theoretically from literature and from movies. And then uh, Yuri and Rick's a uh, lot of support when we were starting our school in Czech Republic. It was not easy, but uh, we, we, for example, we got uh, one volunteer from Jerusalem Sudbury each uh, first year, like three, four years at the beginning, very, very useful and good. Also, it was a native speaker in English. So uh, we could tell that our school is partly bilingual because of People speak well English, and uh, we always had some volunteers from abroad. So th this was the important influence. Uh, also, uh, Yuri Snariki um, arranged uh, our participation in the Sudbury uh, workshop, European Sudbury workshop. It's a network of schools in Europe. And we uh, went to Amerze in May 2015, where I also met uh, Memsi Sadovsky, she was visiting this meeting. And uh, we have met uh, many other schools, so it was great. But then, I mean, always the, uh, what, what is most important is the real life on the, in the school and how people are capable to really uh, have a full trust uh, to themselves and to, to other people, to the kids, etc. So, I, I, I would now uh, suggest that I briefly speak still about uh, experience from Israel because of the, I have something to add to your uh, questions. And what I now understood from Yudis and Rike when I was with Anna, that uh, this financing uh, from government in Israel, uh, there is one interesting issue which uh, I found really interesting also for the situation in Czech Republic because we are also dealing with government. I will come back to this. Uh, is that I understood, but okay, please, it's my interpretation, what I have understood from, uh, from them and maybe it's not... Uh, perfectly correct. But what I understood is education there was somebody who was very much kind of enthusiastic about supporting also uh, the Sudbury type of democratic schooling in Israel. And he offered kind of deal uh, that uh, the government would start to uh, finance because if I understood if there is a fully recognized school in Israel, uh, the government has to provide the building free of charge to the school. And some schools, like the Kanaf school, it's also one of the oldest uh, democratic uh, schools and Salbari model schools in Israel. Uh, this governmental um, support, or how to call it, and it was working quite well first years. Uh, there was no any uh, special pressure. But now I understood because of there were some changes in the regional governments, which have big influence on the schools. At a local level, there is a pressure, for example, in Kanaf to change the director of the school so that it will become more like the school uh, following the uh, kind of ideas or paradigms of the politicians at the local level, which is, seems to be really a disaster. So I don't know, but it looked really not good, this development. And luckily, the South Jerusalem didn't join this. Maybe it was related uh, to what Beth uh, was re referring to. Yeah, there, there was this choice made uh, some years ago. Yeah, so 
this was yeah maybe this important observation or information I got now, and then very briefly because of yeah, I, I could talk of course uh, about many things, but if I should uh, briefly describe or characterize uh, our school, so uh, we are now uh, in seventh year. Uh, we have uh, like ninety students in the basic school. It's uh, the age between uh, six and uh, 15. And we have two years already also. High school, which we wanted to have the uh, full students. So we now succeeded to have also this uh, part. And there's like 22 students uh, in this part or even more starting September. We are still getting more. And we feel like we are Are on the edge, like when we are at this, like uh, 100. Also, we have some small kids uh, uh, being part of the school community who are, uh, it's not formal, but there are some staff members who have small kids and they uh, come very often to the school. So we have a group of uh, also uh, like kindergarten age uh, children. And if I should um, somehow make characteristics of uh, the concept, the educational concept, so we are very much inspired by Sudbury, but I was always telling in the meetings like the Sudbury workshop that I don't think we are really uh, kind of clean. Uh, Sudbury school because of we, we have offer of um, activities uh, similarly to students. Uh, and uh, so from this perspective, it would be more like uh, kind of summer hill type of school. But we try not to give so much importance to the academic uh, subjects. So many of our offers uh, are really like, like uh, women's circles or uh, I mean, really uh, subjects which come from the interest of kids. Uh, we also have offer like uh, the math or English or this kind of traditional subjects, but they are uh, kind of like minority. And uh, people learn English in their uh, daily activities or uh, talking with other people and uh, they learn math in what they do as a project, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's kind of a hybrid, I would tell. Yeah. So when I now have heard about high data, uh, high data, and uh, what I know from Jerusalem, which I know quite well, I have seen them times visiting the school and uh, spending a lot of time with Judas and Ricky. Uh, so I, I think we, we are somehow kind of hybrid. <laughs> well, how do you call it? But it evolves on its own. Uh, maybe what is different from the traditional survey model also is uh, that we don't have the jurisdictional committee in the sense of uh, the original survey model. But it's, uh, we call it, we started like this similarly to the jurisdictional committee, but now it turned into something what we call uh, big mediation. So we try to solve conflicts through small mediations, which are informal. and. It, If there is a problem which cannot be solved at this one, uh, the issue, and there is formal meeting of uh, committee where our students and kids and uh, staff members, but they really do kind of more mediation than the traditional uh, jurisdictional committee. Um, and uh, okay, I could describe more if you are interested later. And then what I think it's also different uh, that we uh, we moved from the democratic voting, the traditional majority democratic voting. After half a year, the kids came with a kind of tension that they have problem that if they are overvoted by the majority or if they overvote people who don't agree with something and they have to uh, follow uh, the rule just because of they were overvoted. So we created something, what we found later, it's called sociocracy, where uh, it's not a 
about consensus. It's uh, about what they call like consent. It means that you try to develop the best uh, solution in the circle with which everybody can live. So we have a system of like, a uh, uh, question is what, who is against, maybe you know the system. So again, I would leave it if you would be interested for a specific question. And the third column, uh, which maybe is different from some other schools is that the, from the very beginning, use the nonviolent communication as a kind of concept, how to relate to each other, how to communicate, how to uh, solve uh, the conflicts. And we use the concept of Marsha Rosenberg and uh, we also kind of train, for example, parents in this. We offer them training, of course. They, some people don't want to go there, but uh, we also try to uh, have the broader community around the school uh, understand this concept and to use it. So, and then, yeah, and then maybe last point uh, concerning the government. So it's interesting, uh, we have had uh, a uh, lot of discussions, uh, especially at the very beginning, but I found uh, also when comparing the Czech, uh, school legislation with uh, other countries that we have very, in fact, uh, very autonomous uh, schools. So we can have uh, very free uh, educational concepts in place in Czech Republic, if you write well what they call a school educational program. So we spent one year really writing the school educational program in the way that it describes the practice of free democratic school. And it's in agreement with the general law, which is not a big problem because of uh, it's, uh, as I told, very open, but it's giving big autonomy to schools. And uh, more or less the only two things where we have some, we have to do some compromises, it's evaluation because of we have to give kind of certificate at the end of the year uh, and in the middle of the year to each kid uh, about kind of, I don't know how you call it in English, uh, like a certificate at the end of the school year, but normally in the traditional schools, you have evolu a kind of evaluation and even marks. And so we found the way how to write it in the way that it's not really uh, evaluating anything. It's just uh, describing what people do and uh, we try not to give it too much importance so that many people even don't read it, read it whatever. So somehow I think uh, we succeeded to find a way how uh, not, not, not to have it as a kind of burden to the educational concept. And then the second uh, area is uh, like uh, the, uh, safety. We have to do some measures that uh, each time uh, the kids have some kind of uh, supervising or responsible staff member who is responsible for their safety. But uh, it's good that it's, uh, it can be more or less done only on paper. So somebody has to be assigned, but uh, the kids can still have uh, the freedom of free move. and uh, don't see the supervisor it's more for the law requirements so and okay and then uh, kids also can go freely to the garden we have big garden like 4000 square meters and then we we have a kind of um, letter signed by parents that they agree with this yeah also because of the safety issues that they agree that their kids can go without uh, kind of uh, supervision from adults freely outside, etc. So, so there are some issues around this. And of course, we have to do a lot of uh, like reporting on stupid uh, numbers and things. But uh, we see big advantage that um, uh, we are like recognized school. Uh, so uh, the kids don't have to go through any testing. In fact, if you have kids in home education in Czech Republic, they have to do kind of Kind of testing twice a year uh, if they are in homeschooling. So this is what we avoid in our school. 
also we support the network of similar schools in the Czech Republic. I think we have already 16 members. Some are just startups, but some are already well established and also I guess like eight of them already went through inspection successfully with this uh, school educational program. Uh, so it's uh, it's a kind of good uh, situation for free democratic schooling in the Czech Republic. Now the government is preparing some new legislation. So we hope it will be not worsened because it, it is the danger that it will become worse. And in fact, uh, starting uh, August, I will be in some working group uh, established by government on these amendments of leg legislation. So I will try to prevent the bad things to happen there. So they, they made like open call for or competition for, for these groups. So this, I guess, will be also an interesting experience. But okay, I, I think I spoke too long. So uh, this is a nutshell and uh, I'm uh, ready to answer any questions if I can. Can I ask you, uh, uh, Vladimir, about uh, being a recognized school, does it mean like in uh, Israel that you are partially subsidized by the government or uh, all the money comes from? Uh, we, uh, yeah, uh, we are uh, subsidized by government as any other private school. So we have to be private school if we want to have this kind of educational program. And uh, it means more or less that uh, we get uh, relatively a lot of money, in fact. We more or less cover, or we covered uh, the salaries of staff members uh, from this contribution from government. Now it's more, so we also cover some salaries ourselves. And this enables us to have a relatively low fee, which we want to keep because of we want to have the diversity. diverse group in the school we don't want to have like uh, parents so so far we succeed on this i guess also thanks to this uh, governmental funding and but the teachers in traditional schools in the governmental schools yeah. do parents also pay tuition Vladimir? Oh. no yes they pay tuition yes but as I told, it's relatively low. It's now like uh, 150 euro per month. Oh. Yeah, so it's... That's not bad. Mm -hmm. I have a question, uh, if, you, if I may, to everybody, actually. Uh, because for, for you will see that because and for Vladimir for bats for you and uh, Melissa and Christy and Jim and Anna uh, the question is Anna you mentioned not now but when you presented this about Israeli schools at the um, circle school at Jim's uh, school uh, a month ago I think maybe less less than a month ago uh you mentioned interesting phenomena which is i'm constantly thinking about that you mentioned that in israel many people know about democratic schools and they have um, in, in kind of on average kind of low opinion of them because they think it's for the kids who uh, kind of special education kids that's what will call be probably called in the united states who cannot do much, and uh, that's why it's kind of uh, very uh, low uh, kind of standards for them, and that's why it's adjusted for them. Uh, this is what you uh, mentioned, right? What's yeah. interesting for me that in the United States, um, there is two kind of interesting phenomena, and again, I want to check with Melissa, if it's and Jim and Christy, uh, if it's true, in United States, uh, my uh, non-systematic observation. First of all, very few people know about democratic schools. If you like, my students, if I ask about they, they say, "What's that?" Uh, when I explain that or show videos, their opinion very quickly become completely opposite to Israeli. That this is uh, schools for elite kids, for very talented, and they will not work for. Uh, kids who are like so-called average or a special special ed kids. That's for sure will not work. 
Uh, so first of all, uh, like I don't know, I can see Melissa, you know, like that and Jim as well. So it's not like my non-systematic impression in United States is correct about these two things. So my or more, not not, not exactly. That's we, that's interesting. Uh, and Christy, feel free to write on that whether or not uh, it's true or not. Uh, it will be interesting to make it more systematic. So my question is. Uh, first of all, uh, it seems like what's going on in the uh, Czech Republic, Vladimir, for you, and that's uh, any commentary about that. And Jim, I really like that you're saying that like this, uh, because I know that in description of many democratic schools, there is often mentioning disproportional number of the kids who might have uh, what considered to be special uh, needs kids. Yes, but and I'm just telling you, uh, the general public uh, that highly represented my <laughs> people around me and my students will reject that. I, I'm telling them that they will reject that. No, I, they will. It's interesting. They will. <laughs> it's almost like we'll disagree with that without even seeing the whole thing. They will say, "Oh no, these schools are good for uh, talented kids and uh, rich kids. That's for them." Even if I tell them a lot of evidence that contradict that. But it, they will just reject. This is how they are almost like imprinted or paradigm working for them. But say, it sounds like in Israel, it's completely opposite to that. Let me tell you uh, one fact that I also didn't know until recently, that Jakob Hecht uh, uh, created democratic school in Hadera, first one in Israel, because he himself had severe dys dyslexia and bad experiences in school. And he thought that the children should not be, uh, uh, he, his idea of democratic school comes partially also on his experiences that if you are different in learning, that you have differences with the most of the kids in many different areas, you will be a failure in school so that you have to create an environment where all kinds of diverse kids uh, and people and students can find their own way of life, which is not, uh, if, if you have dyslexia, maybe you do something else wonderfully. Maybe you're a musician, who knows what. I'm not, I'm not talking about people who start in school. I'm talking about general public. In general impression, public. Impression of general public. Uh, I don't know, Bets, is that your experience uh, uh, in Israel? Um, it's funny, actually, because I've, I've really come across both uh, both of those examples that you gave people like, oh, what, you know, so so you don't learn anything like they think it's for people who can't learn. And they're like, you so you, like basically lazy people, you're just sitting around doing nothing all day. That's that's one side. And then some I've also come across people who are like, oh, so it's like for the people who are who are super gifted and, and kind of can manage without any structure, but like that's not going to work for, for most people. Um, so yeah, I've, I've come across both. Uh, and of course, I think the reality is, is not really either. <laughs> Very interesting, yes. I, I first heard it in Israel from a uh, person at the uh, Levinsky College for Education in Tel Aviv, who uh, uh, was uh, contemplating about her own kids because they have problems in schools. And then she says, I always worry that if I send them to the schools, that uh, they are schools for children who otherwise failure in other schools. And so what will be their reputation further in life? Yeah, I don't know, Vladimir. Do you did you have any experiences like that? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. a lot of experiences with this, and uh, you can hear at least in the Czech Republic many different like opinions or opinions like assumptions, and it's uh, also like I, I don't think we have heard much about like elite school. It was more like school for stupid, or. Uh, the school for exactly people in needs, like who cannot uh, match the traditional school. And I think everything is because of this big one. And people evaluate this uh, from the perspective of, of the traditional educational paradigm. And then if we speak about our values or uh, concept, we use some words which they interpret completely differently or even opposite. 
and then yeah we try to educate the public uh, uh, we do different seminars and also now there's some movie and but it's long run it's really very difficult but we feel it's important we it's one of the goals of this association of free democratic schools in the Czech republic that we want to really make awareness uh, within public what is it about especially parents the vision very interesting that's uh, what about you jim uh, uh, your experiences about that well i think there's it has changed over time we're approaching 40 years and and so we have we've had more time to establish a reputation for the circle school rather than for democratic schools but my experience is very much uh, in accord with what eugene said that most people in that we deal with have never heard of democratic schools or self-directed schools um, and that's even after 40 years in the same community now we have a, a remarkably high compared to what we used to have number of people who have heard of us from multiple places and their impressions run the gamut. We certainly have people like like um, Melissa said in the chat that that think that any private school is is for the wealthy or the elites. Um, we have some um, typically other educators in, in nearby uh, private schools for the wealthy who think that um, circle school is a place for kids with special needs or, or kids who have some kind of learning disability. So we see it all. But another pattern that I s s see, and Eugene, it's sort of why I was doing this, is that um, I have worked closely with, with uh, a couple dozen of the schools in the US. And what I've observed is that, that they have their own sort of localized impressions formed in their general public. Um, I know of uh, uh, one school that became sort of deeply embedded in the um, in the sort of funky, geeky uh, community locally. And this is in a, an urban setting and they got a reputation for that. And, you know, you get a reputation for something uh, other schools have admitted uh, a large number of kids with autism spectrum disorder. And then they get a reputation for being a great place for kids with ASD. Um, uh, others, I know another school that, that is, has a reputation as a hippie school. And the, the, the more those, you know, the, the new young schools wanna get kids and families and so, they tap into some particular vein in the culture early on, and that may spiral into looking like a, a specialized school. So um, I think there's, it's hard to generalize across the United States because there are many different localized impressions. Uh, I wanna comment about the subject of money and regulation. And um, Eugene, you posed your question as though the two are tied together, making a deal with the devil. If you accept the money, then you accept what goes along with it. In Pennsylvania, I'm sorry to say that money and regulation are separate issues. We get the regulation, but we don't get the money. The, in, in Pennsylvania, there are, there are three categories of schools. There are public schools, there are religious schools, and there are other private schools. The, the other private schools are subject to regulation that is, that's pretty heavy. And the, the only the religious schools escape that. But even the religious schools are required to, um, in, the, in the law, to teach certain subjects in the English language. They don't, there is no regulator. There's no regulator who's authorized to enforce that with religious schools, but with, with non-religious private schools, there is direct regulation by the Department of Education and no money.
Thank you, Jim. Maybe you should announce like uh, spaghetti monster religion at the, the circle school to get to, to have less regulation. <laughs> <laughs> Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania prides itself on its regulation, and in the United States, many of the states all across the country, when you go to the grocery store and buy groceries, if you look carefully at the label, there may be a little abbreviation and a phrase that indicates that they meet the regulations of Pennsylvania regarding food and agriculture. Because if you meet the regulations for Pennsylvania, you've almost automatically met the regulations for everywhere else in the country. The, um, a, a similar thing applies to regulation of, of schools. It's not, it's not quite as severe, but, but it is. We have um, uh, the circle school for all of our existence has um, hmm, struggled with antagonistic bureaucrats who want us to fit into the mainstream. And I would say that's probably the the, the prevailing general opinion in our area of the circle school is that they're this weird school that doesn't do the same thing that the public schools do. Um, but we have worked out our ways of, of meeting those regulations. Partially about the religious schools uh, yeah, and uh, the freedoms they have from the government regulation. This was a par partially uh, part of the lawsuit that uh, Jim and uh, I were involved in about uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, probably even maybe more against the state of Pennsylvania wanting to put the Pledge of Allegiance uh, in every school beginning. And uh, the state of Pennsylvania could not pass that in the first place in the 80s or 90s because of the religious schools. Uh, and then they revamped it uh, in the beginning of, I think it was 2003 or something like that, and uh, exempt the religious schools. But uh, yeah, I think that the, the same rule that there is ideology, which may not be religious, but was a credo of the school that would go against that. Mm -hmm. One comment that I want to make, it's very important. I, I understand this is like a oppression, a state oppression that coming on the on the schools but one important thing is not to allow that oppression to be to colonize people because one of the danger is to start seeing all this uh, regulation as a part of kind of oh it's actually not bad it's actually good and uh, to and i i uh, i'm right now working on reviewing a book and i'm afraid that's exactly what's happened with them and uh, and it's happening, unfortunately, time to time with people who kind of rationalize oppression and uh, claiming that this is actually a good thing and it's a it's a good for education rather than think that we have to maybe submit to that, but we have to fight that at any time and maybe sometimes sabotage that. It's protection of the consumer. Yeah, exactly. Uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. About the ideology that I uh, uh, read uh, recently, uh, I'm reading a book about all these different schools in Israel. And one of the things is uh, this critique that uh, these schools are not diverse in terms of ideology, that uh, they attract people who, whose families already bought in the ideology of uh, democratic school or something like that. And in Israel specifically, that it's the Ashkenazi, the European Jews, elite intellectuals, as opposed to other types of Jews that exist, and of course, Arab, Arab uh, population there. And so that this uh, yeah, uh, overall critique about diversity of families and, uh, and internally uh, that sometimes it create, creates difficulties for the student if their family uh, ideology is not congruent to the school ideology. Uh, so I don't know what your experience is with that. We uh, at the Circle School explicitly want to accommodate families whose parenting practices and ideologies don't match the schools. Um, and so we have, and that's part to us, that's part of being a democratic school is being able to, to accommodate and support families with all kinds of worldviews. Um, that is not typical of the self-directed democratic schools generally, but it, it's a particular 
principle that's important to us. Um, so, uh, and we do that. We have we have had some families whose whose uh, parenting practices are very authoritarian, and others who are sort of uh, their the parents are like jellyfish, um, and uh, mostly in between. Mm -hmm. But again, that's I don't think that's typical generally of democratic schools mm -hmm. in the U.S. It's very interesting that you're trying to maybe be more a, a pluralistic school, but on the other hand, it is a democracy. It is a ideology that it's uh, in itself drives this uh, uh, kind of like pluralistic view. We're trying to demonstrate the feasibility of democratic education for wider application. And it, to demonstrate it, we have to be able to accommodate uh, a wide range of of uh, family practices and ideologies and worldviews. Well, what does it mean for uh, the uh, Anna, can I just interrupt, sorry. Uh, I just want to say that, can I, I want to jump that, that's exactly I'm going to discuss in the next, our next meeting about, because this is where I see the difference between a notion of community and notion of society uh, as a normative uh, vision of the education of joint self-education. Uh, where the idea of community is this idea of having common uh, denominator and common uh, ideology uh, and attempt to do that and, and spread it, as uh, Jim is saying, to the uh, parenting and to the other views. It could be religious views, it could be political views and so on and so forth. Uh, and the idea of the society, exactly this idea of the pluralism and uh, which is in a way you said uh, it's another ideology. I'm not sure that it's another ideology because it's in a way it's uh, it's in things in its own because of its pluralistic. By the way, it which means it will accept to a certain degree non-pluralism as well, like Tim is talking about. Like okay, well, there is uh, somebody who don't believe in democracy, and that's part of us as well. It's categorically uh, different. It's categorically yeah, different exactly. because. Because most of the, um, the alternatives want to impose their own ideology or worldview on everyone, and so this is uh, this is if this is just one other way of seeing things, as Eugene's saying, it is one that explicitly uh, promotes mm, tolerance—not just tolerance, but support for a great variety of of worldviews and ideologies. This is uh, what I found on the Jerusalem Sudbury School website. Of course, this is Google Translate from Hebrew. So it does, doesn't say community, it says society explicitly there. I don't know, Beth, uh, what you think about that. Uh, whether the, the uh, Jerusalem Sudbury School really is uh, uh, trying to attract diversity in various uh, yeah, ways among the families and students. And what happens if, if the family is different than school for the student themselves, not for ideology, but for the student? I think the, the school definitely tries to, to attract their, you know, a diverse uh, um, student body, but I think it's something that is, you know, at the end of the day, it's sort of if, if people aren't interested in certain societies or cultures, then we can't bring them by force, obviously. Um, so, so I think it's not quite as diverse as, as we would like, probably, or um, as one would hope but but you know but not for the lack of trying that's that's for certain everyone is welcome um and there are people from different religions and faiths and secular and non-secular um but but i think you do see a, a disproportionate number of of middle class ashkenazi jews uh i think that's just the reality um but what was the second uh Point you asked something, and now I If uh, what does it mean for a person, for a student, if their family is really different from the, what they experience in school? Doesn't it create a, a struggle or what? Right. So I think 
can say that I, I've seen it personally with students um, would come to school and, and their parents then give them uh, like private lessons. They weren't learning in school, so, so they needed to learn at home. Um, and what we saw is that that would, that would really undermine the, the, you know, way the school works, because then they feel, okay, so like in school, I'm not doing serious things. So they, kind of, they wouldn't treat it seriously because, because they would have their, you know, all their private lessons after school. And also some of them, you know, it would be a struggle in terms of time that they've got suddenly all this extracurricular um, studies that they need to get done. And by and large, I think we saw that, that it, was, it was a real struggle for them um, personally uh, and, also, and also for the school because then they'd come to school and maybe they were interested in something, but they wouldn't push it forwards, you know, and, and school because, because they were doing it at home because their parents were making them do it at home. Um, so it sort of also lost the potential resource uh, for for progressing some you know something some topic in the school. It's very interesting. Um, I've got to jump off in just a couple minutes, but I, I just wanted to share. Um, in our school, of course, we're we're uh, much less mature, I would say, than than the circle school. Um, but we have. We've been open for what, maybe since 2008. Um, I feel like there's definitely a clear gap between families who come to our school out of desperation. And those families are much more likely to not be very democratic at home. And, um, and you know, those kids usually stay for a year, two years um, until their parents think they're fixed enough to go back to regular school. And then we have the families who are really attracted to the philosophy and, and they, those families stay longer. They're more likely to be similar at home. And um, interestingly, this is just at our school, we did sort of an informal survey of what the, the occupations of the parents, and they were in four categories. There were entrepreneurs, teachers, artists, and um, what was the last one? Um, holistic health providers. Those were the parents who really were, were um, you know, attracted to our school, not of the, that are not of the other category. Um, so, so that's just kind of informal observations um, up until this point, but that's, that's what I've seen. That's right. Vladimir, you wanted to also say something. Yeah, I wanted also to comment. It's very interesting and important point uh, Jim raised. I think, and we see interesting developer kind of open to anybody who wanted uh, to try this concept. We faced uh, really problems with some parents, with some families who were authoritarian. In fact, one of this, uh, Uh, kind of uh, conflicts between uh, paradigm and school paradigm led to one inspection which was unexpected and the parents they called the inspectors to change in fact the, I, I see the problem with the authoritarian parents they uh, try sometimes to change the school and uh, the concept of the school and this is really dangerous then uh, but also I have seen that we have had some authoritarian or more kind of authoritarian parents who changed with the school. So they became more uh, democratic uh, thanks to the school and they appreciated this. So uh, uh, And I think it was very much also because of at the beginning we were accept uh, that uh, they want uh, to, to join the school. And as we have now quite big uh, um, extra interest uh, in the school, so we can choose the acceptance committee and especially the kids in the acceptance committee are very, in fact, quite uh, strong in questioning these things. And we are getting more and more uh, parents who are already tuned to this philosophy. In fact, they really look for the school like this. This is something new. It was not here this uh, five, seven years ago. So this,
changing. And my theory is that uh, we are the society which is shifting from the hierarchical systems to more um, kind of uh, flat and self-managed systems. And I see it in business. I also do some job in business where I work with the teal organizations and it's happening in business. And I, I think, uh, Jim, it could be very interesting longer discussion because of, uh, I, I would see it probably as a kind of, if people are not open to change, they are authoritarian and they want uh, to enjoy the privilege of being in the, the circus school, for example. I think the question is why not to allow to have uh, some uh, kids which have parents which are more tuned and which will really stay and enjoy this opportunity because of what we have seen with the authoritarian families, the kids have kind of uh, tension or not tension, it's a really problem that uh, they feel at home there are some expectations and in school uh, there are different uh, kind of expectations like that you will really manage yourself, your education, you will explore yourself, uh, your life and your uh, interests, etc. in self-directed learning. And I think the kids from authoritarian families have big problem to start uh, this uh, process uh, to really, to in fact use the concept of free democratic school. But okay, but I think it would be really for longer discussion. And I also feel this issue of not being like against society or something like um, not to be exclusive or all these things we also want to avoid. But again, yeah, it's maybe some to find some equilibrium uh, here. Yeah. So thank you. This is yeah, I agree. Nice, nice it, would, it would be a fun extended conversation, Vladimir. I think um, we over the years we have experienced the um, the phenomena you talked about of a family or or people who want to change the school one way or another. Um, we don't see that much anymore, except when, as it relates to a particular student. So particular parents might want a particular change to accommodate their student. Um, but the, the, the difference, the dichotomy between the school's principles and, and family principles, I think one way that we, that we make that work or, or try to is um, we, during the admissions process, we do our very best to discover mismatched expectations or mismatched worldviews and ideologies. And we are very clear, ideally with both parents and the student or students present, we're very clear about saying the school is intended as a public space for kids. It's not an extension of home and family. The school does not intend to be in collaboration with parents to engineer their children's education. This is a, a public space. And we try to call attention to the ways in that in which that might create friction for the parents and the students that um, you know at home, it sounds like you're you expect your children to do X, Y and Z at school. We don't have that expectation or at school. We expect everyone to participate in housekeeping and doing chores and at home that we hear that's not an expectation. Is that going to be a problem for you? Or, or dad, and it usually is the dad, I hear that you have some real expectations about academics and the rigor of homework and so on. And dad, we don't have those expectations here. Is that gonna be a problem for you? Is that, going to, is that gonna bug you? Can you release that concern and allow your children to be, to experience the freedom that they have at the circle school? It obviously isn't gonna make the differences go away but what it does is it gives the student the, the standing and to, to exercise that freedom at school and to be free of the fear that the, the child is doing something their parents don't know about. Because we've said openly with the parents present, here are the kinds of things your child may do at school that you might not approve of, um, but they do have that freedom here. If that's not acceptable, don't enroll your child. So we're rec we try to recognize those differences and highlight that um, the kind of friction it might contain. Then the other thing it does is it opens the channel for us to later to say to the parent, 
hey, you in, in could be in a social event, it could be in a formal meeting, but to say to them, you know, you had this concern, you recognized that you that you don't you didn't particularly like this aspect of the school. How's that going for you? Um, so it opens the channel, it gets it out in in the open air that these differences exist. And I think that helps tremendously. It doesn't necessarily make the challenges go away, but it makes it a lot easier to talk about them and to process the, the points of friction when they come up. And, and uh, Jim, I can I ask you, you uh, right now wonderfully described one way issue. What about the opposite issue? Like for example, what if parents uh, will force their children to do homework at home? Uh, and you will say, that's your prerogative, that's fine. Uh, school will not interfere with that and will not criticize you and will not do anything about that. Yeah, that definitely happens. And, and the dad example, the hypothetical I gave would be a good example of it. Um, the, 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 uh, the parent might then say, well, okay, then, then I'll, I'll make him, I'll make my kid do um, math worksheets at home or something like that. When that subject comes up and we bring it up if we think it's a thing or a year later, if we see it happening, we will bring it up with the parent. Again, we'd say exactly what you said, Eugene, we, this, that's your prerogative. We're not going to interfere with that. And let's be clear about two things. One is we're not going to enforce that on your child at school. Three things actually. Um, we are we're not going to report to you about what your child whether your child is complying with your orders at school and then third here's how it's going to undermine your child's experience at school they're going to feel some guiltiness or some fear about being discovered if they don't do the things that, at school that you've required they're going to get the impression as bets was saying right on board with bets on that 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 uh, they're gonna get the impression that you, the parent, disvalue their experience at school or think that it's somehow deficient and that they need, they need something else. And that's gonna undermine their experience at school, um, sometimes only by really subtle mechanisms. The, the, the whatever it is they're forcing the child to do at home, more often than not falls by the wayside after a while. The kid doesn't do it, or the, the parent becomes lax about enforcing it. Um, sometimes that goes in a good direction. The parent will then come to us at some time and say, hey, you know, I was really skeptical about this when we started two years ago, but wow, my, I see that my daughter, my son has flourished and they're really emerging as a, as a whole person and, and I, I've let go of that. Um, uh, or if that doesn't happen, then the child may feel sort of a, um, a subtle fear of loss of parental love. If I am not doing what, what I'm told to do, either at home or at school, um, and we're not talking about it openly, then um, I'm meeting with the disapproval of my parents. And that's, that's not a good influence on kids. Um, but yes, we absolutely, Eugene, we say point blank to parents when they ask us for parenting advice. The ideal is that we say we, we really don't have, we're about schooling, we're not about parenting. So, so we don't really have advice for you about how to parent. But what we can tell you is that in similar circumstances in the past, here's how it has played out. But we're not, we're not laying this on you, that we're just giving you the information about how it has played out. Maybe for you, you can you can um, get a you can resolve this uh, discrepancy in your own thinking, or maybe you will decide you can't enroll your children here, or maybe you will decide that the only way you can make it work is if you give your give your kid assignments at home. And we want you to know that if you do that, we're not we're not judging you for that. We're we're telling you how it has played out in past circumstances. It may be completely different for you. Every parent-child relationship is different. Every family is different. Um, so we don't know what's best for you. You've got to make that determination. And, and to some degree, what I just want to say, it fits to the, like, uh, in your life, uh, not only for the children, for everyone. We participate in so many different institutions, uh, communities, societies, relationships, and they're very different. And by the way, and this, uh, well, even almost crazy idea to make them homogeneous. 
uh, it, it's, uh, it doesn't work like that. And I think it's a bad idea to make everything homogeneous. Um, maybe for some tickets, maybe good to have uh, authoritarian relationship, uh, and that's fine if it's limited. And uh, you said uh, there is nothing like it's. I want to just remind you famous uh, work uh, by Immanuel Kant about education, and he said it should be, for example, rational, and he always put except in religion, and he really believed that. It's not his critique of religion was, but he really believes that in religion. You don't should not use a reason. It's it because it's based on the faith. And you see, it will be strange to from his point of view to homogenize the whole everything, all uh, demands. And I think it's a part of that. It's not necessarily one, even if you think, oh, actually, I think it's good to everybody be like that. I think it's a bad idea, actually. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. One more question that I have for Vladimir uh, for maybe future our, of our studies of democratic education is about this European uh, community of democratic schools that you are going to participate in because uh, at least I don't know much about it and uh, it would be interesting to uh, tell us more how it uh, got there and the, uh, how it works and how we can maybe uh, get to know somebody. Mm -hmm. I learned about UDEC uh, from the European Salbury workshop, from the Salbury schools organized in Europe. And I understood uh, many of them are members of UDEC, but they feel it's quite, I mean, it's very wide, uh, very, very wide. Uh, on the website of UDEX, uh, ethos of uh, um, volunteer uh, participation of kids in any activity. So you kind of sign that you don't uh, motivate kids to do something. But what I understood, many schools who are members of UDEC are not like this. I know one from the Czech Republic, which was the member already a long time ago. They started. Did like Sudbury School with a with a package kind of uh, uh, output oriented and uh, academic outputs oriented school, and still they are member members of UDEC and it's a compulsory education there and everything. But okay, nicely packed. But so I think you can find many different schools. This is one observation. It's like we have now a good partnership with um, uh, School der Rümte in the Netherlands, uh, which um, is also a member of UDEC. And also it's, I would tell, definitely fully free democratic school with also nonviolent communication use and social decision making and fully voluntary activities of all the kids and students. And, uh, but they don't feel like to be Sudbury. They also have the offer and they have also kind of mentorship, which would be another big issue. In fact, we don't have mentorship from the legal point of view that each kid is assigned to some adult uh, in the books. We write about uh, what is happening in the school for the government which we don't have a big problem with, but it's a lot of work. We, we just uh, write what the kids do and it's okay in the language government wants to hear. And we, we try not to really pretend anything. So we, we really report the reality. And uh, so, okay, so uh, if I come back to the question on UDEC, uh, we learned about UDEC from the Sudbury workshop. We became member as a network. So they allow the membership from countries as like uh, regional chapters. I, I think they have something like this in France, for example. 
And so uh, I don't know if we were already registered. It's uh, being arranged by one colleague just now that uh, we applied uh, to be registered as a chapter of UDEC, the, the network of uh, uh, schools in the Czech Republic. And I, I don't think it was already registered. And uh, the main advantage uh, could be that uh, first, it looks good. Uh, for example, when we told inspection that we are a member of uh, UDEC, uh, they liked it because of they don't fully really understand the concept when they visit us, but they understand somehow it works and it's somehow backed up from some concept uh, spread in Europe. So, okay, because of this big autonom uh, autonomy of the schools in Czech Republic, they accept it. And I think UDEC helped in this. And also, uh, there seems to be some uh, knowledge transfer, which we didn't uh, use yet, but which could be interesting. So, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Maybe we go for um, getting yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anybody have any, any more questions or comments, interesting things to discuss? What would you recommend, Bets, uh, for us to study more about democratic schools? Uh, like if I go back to Israel, where should I go? Good question. I don't. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Okay. I I even found that there might be a, a a democratic school in the Arabic side of Jerusalem, uh, or nah, in the Arabic population of Tel Aviv, not Jerusalem. So that would be for me. Sorry, my internet cut out again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. So have you heard of the uh, uh, democratic school in Tel Aviv uh, for the uh, Arabic population in Tel Aviv? No, I haven't actually. Um, it's also been a long time since, uh, since I visited any other democratic schools, but I know there's one in, in Arad, and I was in Kanaf, but those are the only two uh, that, that I've ever visited. Okay. It's an interesting idea to for me to study because I think there are um, all kinds of, uh, besides ideological congruity, there are also all kinds of prejudices about a democratic education that might be among other populations, uh, like this one, that it's right. just a uh, uh, place for students with problems in learning or something like that. There may be some other prejudices too, or that it's just for rich people or who knows what. All right. so. I want to just thank you for coming. It, uh, it's a very nice uh, to discuss. And the next time it will be Eugene in two weeks from now with his uh, new uh, study about difference between community and society and what it means in education. Thank you, Anna. It, it's so good to hear about your experiences in other DEM schools. It, it helps us do better as a democratic school. And uh, thank you, Vladimir and uh, your best for coming from uh, Europe and from Israel to this and <laughs> inviting you to participate more uh, uh, or organize whatever you want uh, in our open symposium about uh, democracy in education or dialogue in education, freedom in education, whatever. <laughs> And I just want to remind you that you can create your event that you want to discuss something, share some problems, ask for help about something that will be great. So feel free to uh, sign up for this uh, uh, 
Google spreadsheet and uh, and again welcome to other events. So uh, thank you very much everybody for inviting me, especially Anna, yeah, of course, but uh, for also accepting me. <laughs> Vladimir has these pauses. I really appreciate and it was very interesting. Yeah, so uh, I look forward and uh, for example, this uh, topic raised by Jim is very interesting. So I hope I will be able to participate. So thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, Bats. Thank you, Jim. Eugene. Thank you all. It was very interesting. Thanks a lot. Okay. And I that, it was very nice to see you again. Yeah, in fact, we have met uh, some time yeah. ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, very nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, you as well. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye.